can see so many people joining us today. We're, we're most grateful um, for your interest in, in synthetic data, and we hope you'll find the session today so useful um, in your day-to-day -day discussing with your colleagues about how synthetic data can be used. Um, to enhance the, the sharing of longitudinal data, but also the sharing of, of any other type of data in research in, in, in general. So I will start. I'm Christina Malter. I'm the Data Collections Development Manager at UK Data Service. Um, and I am delighted to have on the call um, my colleague Jules, um, a synthetic data um, expert. Um, she is going to be talking about how you can actually create synthetic data but also giving you the background um, of how do we, why do we create synthetic data, what purposes there are for synthetic data, and so on. Without further ado, um, what are we looking at today? So firstly, we're having a brief introduction into the project that um, has helped us have the session today. So that is the skills development for managing longitudinal data for sharing. Um, and we are most grateful for ESRC and MRC for providing funding for this project. Um, then my colleague Jules is taking over and talking with you about synthetic data, what is synthetic data, what types of synthetic data there are there, what purposes can we actually use synthetic data for, and how can we generate synthetic data. Um, we want to make sure that we have sufficient time for questions. Um, you can use the Q&A um, in, um, in the Zoom directly. You can also use the chat functionality, or if you would like, you can actually use a Padlet as well, um, as long as you're not signed in to the Padlet and it's in the chat now, um, it's in the wrong chat, it's in this one that we want to put it in. Um, if you are not signed in to Padlet, all the questions are completely anonymous. Um, so you can you can enter your questions there um, and we'll be we'll be able to um, help you uh, with any questions you might have. Um, now, before we go into the presentation itself, uh, let's do a little bit of getting to know each other. Uh, by going to Mendy, you can, I'll put it in the chat as well. Uh, there's a link if you would prefer to follow the link directly, um, or if you want to go to menti.com and use the code 341192. We only have three questions, um, but this gives time for more people to join us as well. Um, and it, it's really helpful for us to understand um, what challenges you're facing, what do you think of synthetic data overall, um, and also um, trying to understand how we can best support you at UKDS as well. This is only a, a training session, but we're very open to questions, so please do get in touch with us. Uh, with any any questions that you might have. So first and foremost, what are the key challenges you face when managing longitudinal data for sharing? Um, do think about the sharing process itself as well. For example, I don't know, choosing a responsible repository where the data should be shared, documenting data. It can be any challenges um, that you have found. You might already have solutions in place, um, for these challenges, um, but it's generate training data, um, but it's trying to think how we can best help data managers ensure that as much longitudinal data is being shared as possible. Training new researchers, generate training data. Everyone on the call is in the mind for synthetic data. That's fantastic uh, because this is what we'll, Jules will be talking a bit later today, and we're going to see how amazing um, synthetic data can be for all of those um, um, answers that are coming on the screen. Validations, there's few data. These are fantastic responses. Thank you so much, everyone. Useful documentation. I'm going to talk about our introductory sessions as well, and the, those cover documentation as well. Data quality, training keeps com coming up, data provenance. Again, we have done some training um, introductory sessions, so we'll go over those as well. And all the materials are freely made available online. You can use them, reuse them, share them. We, we're, we're encouraging that. Now, let's have a think. What are the key ways synthetic data could transform the management and sharing of longitudinal data? What do you think about that? Um, 
So it's all about thinking what potential benefits synthetic data can bring to the management and sharing of longitudinal data. And we know for a fact with, with longitudinal data and actually a lot of survey data, when we go into that granular feedback, that data needs to be made available in a trusted research environment. There are quite a lot of access steps people need to take. So, so anything uh, along those lines, yes, early feedback, initial testing, using training. Yes, the training keeps coming up. We love that. Uh, quick code development, fantastic. Yes, yes, reproducibility. Yes, and with reproducibility, we're going to see it, it is fantastic, especially when we're talking about control data or data that's made available under different and um, access uh, conditions. Privacy, look how many they're coming up. This is amazing. Scale, easier to access, reduce disclosure risks, generate realistic data. That's fantastic. And we're, we're, we're so happy to have you all on board. Um, it, it's clear that you are so, so enthusiastic about synthetic data, just as we are. So, so that is great news. And one final, Menti, what are some key aspects you would like to learn of or learn about? by the end of this workshop. And we're asking this um, to actually start thinking, is there any other type of training we should be providing? Are there specific topics when it comes to synthetic data that you really want to delve deeper? Because we know with training, we, we, we can't have unlimited time. Well, we could have unlimited time, uh, but no one might join us for that because there are other things to be done as well. So we do try to keep our sessions to two and a half hours or half days to half days. Um, how it replaces real data, and we're going to be discussing um, about some misconceptions when it comes to synthetic data, how to do it, and if it is possible in R. Today, my colleague Jules is talking about um, uh, Python in Jupyter Notebooks, but R is totally possible. The method of generating synthetic data, fantastic. There's practices for data generation and sharing how to build it into workflows, um, can it replace real data? I like how these questions are coming up. You're all fantastic. Thank you so much. How to train researchers when to use it, um, best practices, existing validation on questions in this field, um, how to communicate that this is synthetic data. Yes, um, that, that's very, very important. Um, and we're still preparing best practices around that. What type of documentation do we actually put along with synthetic data? Now, thank you all so much for all the answers. Uh, we'll be using the Menti um, to, to make sure that we can include even more training sessions. Um, just very, very briefly, in case people on the call are, are unaware about the UK data service, we do host the largest collection of social, economic and population research data. And it's not only about providing access to the data, it's about support, guidance and training as well. Our mission is to facilitate high quality social and economic research and education. So we support data owners and data users as well, agnostic in terms of their background. There could be government, academia, it doesn't matter as long as they use data. Um, UK Data Service is a partnership between UK Data Archive at University of Essex. So for example, um, Myself, Hina and Gail on the call, we're based at University of Essex, but my colleague Jules is based at Katie Marsh Institute at University of Manchester. We also have colleagues at CHISC, um, EDINA and also UCL. Uh, we do support the development of best practices for data preservation and sharing standards. And of course, this is where synthetic data comes in as well. Um, a couple of stats about us. We do have around 9,700 data collections out of which over a thousand are cohort in longitudinal studies, and we ingest around 250 new data collections and new editions each year. We have roughly 50,000 registered users, and to put it in practice, every six minutes, every day, someone accesses data from UKDS. So um, if you've never used UKDS before, by all means, come to us, get in touch with us. Uh, we're happy to have Zoom calls as well, not only emails. Now, as I've mentioned at the beginning, we wouldn't be here if it wouldn't be for Population Research UK, okay? which is a national resource designed to maximize the use and benefits from UK longitudinal population studies across social, economic and biomedical sciences as well. So skills development has been identified as a priority need within the wider LPS community. And we have been commissioned to undertake this investigation into data management provision with a particular need to focus on wider data sharing. 
So when we do training, we're always thinking of how can more data be shared? How can we make it available more widely? Of course, reproducibility, transparency, and so on comes into place as well. We have had numerous work packages throughout the project. So we've done originally a, a brief audit of existing training resources. We've done a survey and engagement with the OPS data manage management community. And this is where we've realized there's a clear need for introductory research data management workshops. And I'm talking about documentation, anonymization, but also focus sessions. Synthetic data kept coming up and up during the survey and during our discussions with data managers. And therefore, we have the session today and we're most grateful for having um, Jules' knowledge and skills um, to be able to deliver this. All of the materials will be available as open access. We're looking at publishing them via Zenodo, but they'll be available on the project webpage as well. So you can actually adapt and reuse them as well for your own purposes. And finally, we're going to have a final report that's going to be discussing lessons learned from our project, but also next steps. What can the funders do to support more DLPS community? Any feedback, please, please get in touch. We are, we are always welcoming discussions, email, whatever works best for you. So please don't hesitate to get in touch. When it comes to the introductory course, we've actually covered, as, as the title is saying, a very, very introductory basis into data management. From foundational research data management concepts, so we're talking about data management, planning, fair and care concepts, to ethical and legal considerations in handling longitudinal research data. So we're talking about personal information here, Data Protection Act, UK GDPR, and so on. Strategies and best practices for organizing and formatting data. How do I name my files? How do I name my variables? Also effective methods and practices for documenting data. How do I document quant and how do I document qual? especially nowadays that there's so much mixed methods research and mixed methods longitudinal research as well. Techniques and guidelines for anonymizing data and we're introducing the concept of effective anonymization as per ICO guidelines, but also data sharing strategies, overviews and recommendations. How should the data be shared? If I share it this way, what should I do and so on. Again, all materials will be published by the end of November. Um, do keep an eye on the project webpage um, and we hope yet they're going to come of use and you're going to be reusing them um, in your day to day. Um, I'm not stealing Jules Thunder, just as a white synthetic data. I did mention it, it kept coming up in our discussions with data managers um, and also in the survey that we've done. And there's so much applicability from privacy protection to enhanced data sharing, to simulation of models, reducing risk, um, reducing bias as well. There's, there's just so much when it comes to synthetic data. Now, there is actually a fantastic, very recent case study, and that comes from Cypher. They've created a synthetic population um, using spatial microsimulation uh, based on understanding society and UK census data. The work they have done um, in the Understanding Society team at ISER have been fantastic in supporting and making sure that this digital twin can be made available. Um, the data is available via UKDS alongside the replication package. Um, so you can use the replication package as well if you're interested in finding out more. Um, and you can read the full case study and they've been fantastic in creating this interactive dashboard, hopefully promoting even more policymakers to make use of the data. For the dashboard, there's no coding needed, um, coding skills needed, so you can just use the dashboard as it is. Um, that would be it for me. Thank you all ever so much. Um, as I said, any questions, you can use the Q&A, you can use the chat, you can use the Padlet. Um, and I'll pass on to my to my colleague Jules to um, demystify the concept of synthetic data. Thank you, Jules. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Jules Kazmaier. As uh, Christina mentioned, I am at the Kathy Marsh Institute in the University of Manchester. It is a slightly overcast day here. Today, I will be talking about synthetic data. This should not surprise you. You've signed up for the workshop and you got through that introduction. So it's it's what you expect, hopefully. Also, uh, hopefully this will not come as a shock. I'm also using Mentimeter uh, because I find it quite useful 
and um, useful things are good to use. Table of contents for this workshop. First, I'll talk about what data, data is and is not. Then fidelity, a very important concept, which you will hear me use a lot. But then some uses for synthetic data, some methods of generating synthetic data, a break, and then I will switch over out of uh, PowerPoint directly into Jupyter Notebooks, and you can see live coding demonstration, which will be exciting. So synthetic data. Synthetic data, in short, is any data that is generated rather than observed. Usually when we say synthetic data, people people think that it's talking about data generated by a computer. And that is uh, true. Data generated by a computer is synthetic data, but it is not the only kind of synthetic data. So if I were to just make up a string of numbers, that would also be synthetic data. If I were to um, model a bunch of commuters by looking at a map and starting at a random plate, you know, throwing a dart in a map and then go on Google um, Street View and sort of turn right every time there's a red car and turn left every time there's a green car and stop one block after the first chicken shop I see, that would be a synthetic commuter route and it would be generated rather than observed. Even within computer generation, there are many different ways to generate from sort of basic random numbers to complex and elaborate simulations. And there's a lot of machine learning models, which is probably what most people think of with synthetic data. We'll come on to that in more detail later. I'd also want to point out synthetic data can be made based on real world data, or it can just be based on anything, on just sort of random variables. So uh, let's go into some examples of synthetic data that you're probably familiar with, but may not have considered to be synthetic. First one is lorem ipsum placeholder text. Now you'll probably have seen this if you ever open up a, a presentation template, for example, there's probably some gobbledygook text in one of the text boxes to show this is where a text box is. Now this is very much like English text uh, in sort of general structure, but it's not real. No one actually wrote it down, it is generated. Another example is a bunch of fake celebrities created by a generative adversarial network AI uh, trained on photos of real celebrities. Another example, random number generator. Probably you've used this if you've had to do some kind of low cost raffle or, or award a prize in your Zoom quizzes, that kind of thing. And slightly more sophisticated, you can get, <clears throat> pardon me, you can get synthetic dice simulators. So you set how many die you have and how many sides each of those die is, and then you can roll a virtual handful of synthetic dice. This is useful if you don't trust your friends in your online role-playing game group. It is important to note what synthetic data is not. It is not the same as real data, observationally sourced data, that has been anonymized, depersonal personalized, noisified, or otherwise treated to avoid identification. That is important data, but it is not synthetic data. It is important to keep them apart. Some people do not keep them apart, and they use synthetic data when they mean anonymized or depersonalized. Those people are wrong, and I will give them side eye. So here's just a little quiz to see how much we understand all of that so far. Please participate and tell me if you think synthetic data from a cycle lane sensor, or sorry, is data from a cycle lane sensor synthetic or not synthetic? And I will just show the access code again in case anyone is still not quite joined. So far, everyone seems to agree it is not synthetic. Um, yes, good. I appreciate this. The key word there is sensor because since Sensors are a way of observing the real world. Therefore, they are observational data, not synthetic data. Right, this one's a little bit trickier. Are predictions from weather forecasts synthetic? Ooh. Have I got you stumped? Ah, ooh, we've got some uh, differing opinions here. Okay, okay, it's good. So far it's split uh, pretty much evenly, but I think 
not, oh, no, synthetic is winning. <laughs> One person quite honestly has admitted they do not know, and I appreciate your honesty. I would agree with the people who say this is synthetic because predictions are not observations. They are the result of complex computational models that definitely take input from the real world. So they use input from weather sensors, you know, barometric pressure readings, temperature gauges, that kind of thing. But the predictions are the result of a model. Um, so they are output for things that have not been observed. I will agree, though, that one is tricky. I can understand why it's split and why three people have been honest about not knowing. <laughs> How about census microdata? Is it synthetic? This one, I think, ooh, not synthetic. Everyone's everyone's quite clear on this one. No disagreement. I'm good to, I'm, I'm very glad to hear this because census microdata has, of course, been depersonalized in a way. It's been sort of treated so that there's no disclosure risk, but it, you're absolutely right. It is not synthetic. Is the output from chat GPT synthetic? <laughs> so far, everyone, yes, right on board. It is, oh, ooh, we got one not synthetic. I mean, you could say that you are observing the output of chat GPT and therefore it's an observation, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it does it does show that sometimes how you phrase the question matters. <laughs> so yes, I would agree with the majority here. Chat GPT is synthetic. It is producing synthetic that is generated uh, speech or examples or texts or images. How about stuff you just made up in your head on the spot? Synthetic, not synthetic? Uh, good. I'm very pleased to see you're on board with this. because <laughs> This is an example I really like to use to encourage people to think about what makes something synthetic. If you tell a completely fabricated anecdote about how someone stole your lunch uh, but almost choked because you put peanut butter on your coronation chicken sandwich, that and if it's totally made up, that is synthetic. Um, just Just to show, you know. People do weird things, uh, including making up anecdotes about lunch. So setting aside the results of our quiz, fidelity, it's important. Fidelity means faithfulness. And it's very important to highlight that faithfulness is not binary. It's not a matter of is it faithful or is it not? Not all synthetic data is created from real world data. So first, faithfulness might not apply because there is nothing for it to be faithful to. But if there is real world data underpinning the, the generation of synthetic data, you have to have a very good understanding of what the real world data set looks like and ways that the synthetic data is or is not more or less faithful to it. It is important to point out that no line of synthetic data should match any line of the real data if the synthetic data has a real data equivalent. But what do we mean by matching? So another way to say, is it faithful, is it not in this case? And in what ways is it, what counts as a match? What's too close to allow in the synthetic version? And this, this is where it gets real tricky because you can have synthetic data that can be faithful on the number and type of variables, the range, the descriptives, you know, the volume, can have very good and very parallel documentation, very maybe relationships between variables, but which variables? How strong is the relationship? Is it the same direction, but maybe not the same um, sort of degree? So, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways that something can or cannot be um, faithful to real data, assuming there is real data for it to be faithful to. So let's look at a trivial example. Here I have a real data and a synthetic data set, and we can see that they are very similar in some ways. They have the same uh, column headings, for example, the same number of columns, the same number of rows. So in that way, our synthetic version is very faithful. However, you can also clearly see that Q in the real data is coded as either one or zero, and Q in the synthetic is coded as three and four. Now, they both have the same number of 
um, options and they have actually the same number of rows that have each of those options. So again, is it faithful? In some ways, not in others. Likewise, X, Y, and Z, we can see that they have, they are similar, but not exact. So do they have the same mean, same distribution, the same average? We can see that Z, for example, has a different level of precision. Does that matter? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. So maybe that's a faithfulness that we can care about and we would want to change in the synthetic version, but maybe it's a faithfulness that's irrelevant to our research question and we can let it go and be unfaithful in that way. So just some things to think about. Now, the really tricky part about fidelity in synthetic data is relationships between variables. So here I have a plot showing the relationship between weight and height. Now, this is, I would like to say, uh, the kind of relationship that we understand intuitively about the data. We know that the, if someone is taller, they're likely to be uh, heavier as well. But there's also quite a lot of variance in here. So there's it's, it's real closely related for part of it and real distantly related in other parts. Now we could recreate synthetic height and weight data that recreates this relationship pretty well. But what if we wanted to add in more interacting variables like age, ethnicity, occupation, location, um, health conditions, uh, any, other, any number of other potentially interesting interacting factors? Well, it starts to complicate the relationship and it means it's no longer a relationship between just X and Y. It's now a whole suite of variables that contribute to an output. And that is much harder to reproduce in a synthetic version than a simple XY kind of relationship. And the real issue is that outliers. So if you wanna preserve the relationship between two variables, outliers are a bit of an issue because you, can, you cannot preserve, you cannot be faithful on both the minimum and maximum and also the relationship without accidentally recreating a point in the original. Now that would be against the rules for synthetic data. So you would have to say, do you change the minimum and maximum by maybe 10% or do you change the relationship to be a bit of a looser relationship? Do you do both? These are the kinds of decisions you have to make when considering faithfulness. Now, I do want to point out synthetic data, if it's properly made and no lines of the synthetic data match lines of the real data, there is no disclosure risk because there is no real data to be disclosed. However, there is a risk of indication. So uh, malicious actors looking at very high fidelity synthetic data might be able to understand where in that synthetic data a real person is, and then they could go looking for that person. Now, if you only have two variables and each of those is recreated more or less faithfully, it's unlikely they're going to be able to find a real person. But as soon as you start adding in more and more variables about health conditions and age and occupation and you know all these other kinds of things, the risk of indication becomes much higher and that is potentially a problem. So I do want to emphasize again, it's not disclosure risk, it's an indication risk, and that's still a risk you have to be aware of. Now, high fidelity synthetic data. Nothing can be 100% faithful or it would just be the real data. And if you're going to have very high fidelity synthetic data, it probably must be custom built to suit the particular data set, the real world data set that it's trying to synthesize, the research question, and a use case and generation method. That is because you need to be very careful about which features of the original need to be faithful and which can be unfaithful and how faithful or un unfaithful those can all be. So, you know, if you're trying to recreate um, a range and you want to be faithful within 10%, but maybe the distribution is flattened to make the outliers uh, less outliery, if that makes sense. 
so that you are doing a better job at sort of hiding the indication risk in the outlier ranges, but you're now much less faithful on the distribution. So this is a the kind of choice you have to make. Is range important? Is distribution important? Are relationships important? You can't have it all. So you have to think, what can I sacrifice? And that probably depends on your research question. I would also like to point out the greater fidelity is not always better. So some synthetic data is more useful if it is not faithful to the original in specific ways. I'll give you an example. If we want to build an AI tool that categorizes pictures of skin lesions and puts them into categories of low risk, high risk, or, or medium risk, or something like that, we need to be aware that the real data that we might use to train this AI tool on has relatively few photos of skin lesions on people of color. So they've, they've, there's not a good representative set of real world data to train this tool on. So we would want to create synthetic data of skin lesions that is a better mix, a better representation of the variety of people in the world rather than the variety of people who have had their skin lesions photographed. So we would want to go out and ideally collect real photographs of real people and improve our real world data set. But in the meantime, it's much more realistic to think that in the very short term, we can create synthetic photos that show a better variety of uh, skin tones and lesion types. So in that way, we would want our synthetic data to not mimic the original. Just something to consider. Now, purposes for synthetic data. Clearly, if we're training an AI tool to do something on skin tones that are not well represented in our data sa sample, that is one purpose for synthetic data that decides how faithful or unfaithful we want our synthetic data to be. But there are other things to consider. A trivial example for synthetic data is a preview. So a very secure data set, for example, might still want to show what one or two or five rows of data look like. This is useful for showing like what are the headings, you know, what order are the rows in? Uh, what's a typical value that you might find in this column? Things like that. You're probably aware of this kind of synthetic data version. Typically, it can be very small, maybe just one row, and it demonstrates the structure and the style, maybe the shape of the data. It should be very faithful on the number and types of fields and the format, and maybe any features that make this data unique and it may indicate features or relationships of interest, but it's useful in this kind of preview to have obviously fake data. So you wouldn't have real names, you'd have Fakie McFakerson who lives on the moon and has a blood pressure of whatever. You know, those, these kinds of things that you, it's useful in a preview to show, okay, the fields are name and address and you know blood pressure, but you don't want to show a real person's name, address, and blood pressure. Fidelity here only needs to be faithful to the shape of the data. Another one that you'll probably have heard of is toy data sets or proof of concept demonstrations. So another purpose, yeah, this is, this is very useful. You'll probably have seen this. These need to be sufficiently large that they are useful and they need to demonstrate that the concepts that you want to apply to real data you can write code to do it, for example, or you can create a graphic that shows the relationship you're hoping the real data has. They're useful for visualizations, for mapping, for outputs. They can just be a preliminary step, and some fields call them toy data sets, others call them proof of concept data sets. Now, this is useful if the real data does not yet exist, but it will soon, or it exists, but it's very hard to get. So the skin lesion, for example, we could get really good data on skin lesions of people of all kinds of skin tones, but we're not going to do that as quickly as we can do some synthetic stuff. So let's create a toy data set, build an AI model, show that it can discriminate properly for skin lesions on different skin tones. Then we'll go out, get some real world data, train the thing properly. Okay. Here's another quick Mentimeter interaction. 
just testing to see if you have ever used synthetic data for these purposes. Either you created the synthetic data or that you have used someone else's synthetic data for these purposes. Okay, good. We've got some some various interactions here. Yeah, I, I did put, I'm not entirely sure as an option because people are not always sure if the preview they've seen was synthetic or if the, you know, the toy data set that they've used for a thing was based on real data or not, or, you know, yeah. Anyway, good. We've got some variety here. So lots of people have used uh, one or both. Lots of people have also not used anything. That is not entirely surprising um, because, yeah, the synthetic data is still a relatively new concept and uh, I don't expect everyone to have used it yet. Okay, good. Let's move on. Got another couple of options. Availability. So this is useful if the data, the real world data that you would want for your research is impossible. For example, um, it is not currently available or not currently in the right format. It is. It relates to rare or very negative events like, I don't know, pandemics, for example, or uh, Category 5 hurricanes or something like that. If the data would be unethical to acquire or if it's just incredibly, ridiculously difficult to get. So um, this overlaps a little bit with the proof of concept that we talked about earlier, but it extends beyond this to things that are not only just currently unavailable, but may never be available. So, um, you know, we don't, I'll, I'll give you an example that I've used. I did uh, linguistics in uh, some of my earlier degrees, and it is unethical to take a bunch of children and not talk to them for five years and then mash them all together in a room and see how quickly they, they learn language. That is not an ethical experiment. However, you can do that with simulated language learners. You can, you can deprive a language learner of, of interactions and then bang them all together in a room, a virtual room, and see what they do, how their interactions go. That is something you would want to do synthetically, not through observation. That is quite an extreme example, but also things like we don't want to wait around for a hundred category five hurricanes so that we can get good data before we start doing any research on hurricanes like that. Another one, presentation. This is probably one you're familiar with because you've all attended presentations or given presentations. You're attending one right now, so I'm assuming you have all at least seen presentation synthetic data. I had it earlier in the slides. Um, so it has to be sufficiently large for you to make your point. It should be representative only in the ways that are relevant to the point you're trying to make. You can, it's very useful to be clear if it's intentionally synthetic. So again, you might use Fakie McFickerson as a name and Mariana's Trench as an address or something. You should thoroughly test it to make sure that it cannot be mistaken for real data and that it achieves the presentation point that you want. So this is, if you're going to do it, create a, a data set for teaching students or for presenting at a conference or for building a web tool that will be open to the public, you cannot have real data in all of those situations. Um, it depends on, on what your data is, of course, but if your data is secure or, or careful, it, you have to be careful with it in some way. It's best to have synthetic data for those kind of public facing things where you cannot expect everyone who looks at it to have signed a non-disclosure agreement, you know, some kind of end user license. So presentation is another good option for synthetic data. And now I ask you again, have you used synthetic data for availability or presentation purposes. I mean, you will have seen synthetic data for presentation purposes because I used some earlier, but have you ever used it? Um, ooh. Lots of people have created uh, synthetic data for presentation. I'm not surprised because that is a very common, <laughs> very relatable, very understandable purpose for synthetic data. Yeah, okay, good. So lots for, only one for availability. So someone out there is researching rare events maybe or unethical situations. <laughs> I appreciate it, thanks. 
Okay, got a couple of others. Code development. This is another one that I'm sure you will have been aware of. It's very useful to make synthetic data that you um, can efficiently develop your code. So again, it has to be sufficiently large for you, your code testing processes to work, but it's often useful for this kind of synthetic data to be deliberately unfaithful. That allows you to test if your code renders, runs under all possible assumptions and that the code outputs and documentation are clear and useful and that other people can use your synthetic data and code. So I'll, I'll say a little bit more about this. It's useful Let's say you know a new data set is about to be launched, but you want to be the first to publish on it. You have a new idea about how that data is likely to play out and you want to get in there, scoop real fast. Here's my big idea. Well, an example for code development would be then you create a synthetic version and you and your colleagues start developing an R script to create a very useful visualization on this secure data set, this, this hypothetical new secure data set. And you want um, only your colleague will be able to actually access the real stuff, but you won't want to work together to develop the code. So you develop something that they can apply to the real data as soon as it becomes available and you can get your answer and you can publish first. But it is important that you make sure your synthetic data set that you're developing your code on maybe has null values, even if you don't think null values are likely to be there, or that it has negative values or some other kind of errors that really shouldn't be in the data, but you don't want to assume. You want to make sure that your code throws up an error, identifies there's no null value in height. That shouldn't be there. How do you deal with it? Well, you need to deal that in the code development part, not the uh, limited time that you have access to secure data part, if that makes sense. Another one is remote work. We're all attending this workshop remotely. So <laughs> you will be aware that remote work is much more important now than it was in the past. It's also important if you work at different institutions than your you know, collaborators. Uh, so someone maybe houses the data and they're the only people allowed to have the real data, but you know your colleagues at other institutions need to be able to contribute to the project. Well, you can make a synthetic version of the real data and host it remotely on maybe a high powered computer or something like that. And then uh, everyone can, who can collaborate from their different points can come in, work together, and ultimately, one person will run it on the real data, but you use the synthetic to demonstrate everything and make sure everyone's working together. That's an important one that, uh, yeah, is, is much more of an issue now than it ever was. In this case, you want your synthetic data to be large and medium or high fidelity. You'll probably have to custom create the synthetic data because this is one in which you are using synthetic data to replace real data for at least big parts of the project. So it needs to be as faithful as necessary for useful analysis, but not so faithful that it replicates any rows accurately because then it wouldn't be synthetic. So it needs to be portable or workable for diverse computing environments. It has to be useful for reproducing results. It has to be communicated accurately that it is synthetic and maybe why it was created and how. Um, so again, this is a much more modern application for synthetic data. Uh, this is probably not something that people anticipated, you know, maybe even 10 years ago, but increasingly we're all across the world working remotely collaborating with people in other institutions who have other data access policies in their workplace. We need to work together. Synthetic data can be a way to do it. So I saw a uh, code dev come up in some of the, the Mentimeter polls that Christina shared. So I'm expecting to get some results for people who have used code dev. Hooray, one already. Um, Okay, we've got some people who've used synthetic data for remote work, remote collaborations, lots for code dev. Um, no one has used it only for remote work. I'm guessing that's because either people do code dev, or maybe these are the same people that work remotely. So either you're working uh, just on code dev, or maybe it's also remote, but yeah. 
no one's doing just remote. Maybe, maybe the future will change that. Okay, so again, still lots of people who have not used synthetic data for this reason, and that's fine. Most of us will use synthetic data for one or two or maybe a few of these different applications that I'm demonstrating, and there's many more applications for synthetic data. I'm just highlighting some of the most popular ones. Um, it's fine if we don't all use synthetic data in all of these ways. It is, however, important to be aware that other people use synthetic data in these ways and that the requirements that they use to create their synthetic data or use their synthetic data are different than the reasons we might be using or creating synthetic data. And it's fine that we can have different purposes, that you can have different fidelities, we can have different documentation, different generation methods. It really has to be that synthetic data is not seen as one kind of thing. It needs to be seen as diverse and unique and potentially complicated. <laughs> so having said that, let's get on to how to generate synthetic data. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. I am presenting a few of the popular examples. Uh, there are many more. Handmade. So if you're creating preview data, for example, you can probably hand make it. You can just make it up out of your head. It can be obviously synthetic or not. It can be representative or not. It depends on how, what you're trying to preview about it. So, um, but if you're only creating one or two rows or five rows, you can probably just make it up just, just out of your head. That's fine. It's, it's totally appropriate for small scale synthetic data. Less it, other purposes, like maybe code testing purposes or uh, remote work purposes, will probably want to use at least larger volumes that are too big for handmade. So you might use some random or nonsense, especially in the early stages of your code dev work, for example, random numbers is fine. This is generally pretty easy to do. I mean, most programming packages will have an option to create an array of random numbers. Uh, and you can set restrictions on that, like only whole numbers, uh, of only random numbers between this value and that value. You can create random strings. You can create combinations or structured things like random email addresses or random Twitter handles. In fact, most of us will have seen people with random Twitter handles, the uh, string of random numbers who complains about whatever post you've just made. Those are probably uh, generated. Those are probably synthetic bots. Okay, so uh, moving on, machine learning. This is probably what a lot of people think about when they think about synthetic data. They think about the output generated by a machine learning model that has been trained on real data. That is uh, potentially useful. Lots of um, supervised methods like linear regression, decision trees, random forest, neural networks. There's also classification methods. Um, there's unsupervised methods. So the computer just goes off and makes some judgments and it shows you what it's done and you think, yeah, this is fine or no, this is crap. I'm going to chuck it out and try again. These are, um, there's a lot of options here. This is typically low to medium fidelity, though, unless you're creating a very advanced machine learning model for a very specific uh, output. Um, so there are some apps and some tools and some packages. Um, so SynthPop is one, synthetic population. It will help you create uh, fake names and addresses and email addresses and things like that. There's Mockaroo, there's Faker. So some of these are web portals. Some of these are R packages or Python packages. Um, there's a lot of options and we can talk about them, but they're probably going to be med low to medium low. They're not very sophisticated. You have to build something if you want something more sophisticated. Simulation. This is a good one. And it was helpfully demonstrated demonstrated earlier by Christina when she mentioned the Cypher data set. So if you can create a computer simulation in which real or simulated actors and forces and situations are applied, and then you observe the simulated world, and those observations can become synthetic data observations. 
Some people consider artificial environments like wind tunnels or wave pools or vacuum tanks to also be a simulation. They That's a gray area. Depends on what you mean by simulation, what you mean by artificial. But for our purposes, it's probably reasonable to think computer simulations are the most useful. They can create things like the Cypher data set. So here's our synthetic data conclusions. One, and I cannot stress this enough, is that synthetic data is generated, not anonymized. And fidelity matters, but truly high fidelity is not feasible, and it's probably not necessary. Higher fidelity is not always better. Many purposes for synthetic data, many ways to generate synthetic data, and synthetic data is key for reproducibility because you it's just not reasonable to trust someone to say, uh, I have found some incredibly insightful things in this data set and I'm not going to tell you how I did it. What they should be doing saying, here's the code I applied to the real data set. Here's a synthetic data set that I've created, which when you apply my code to this synthetic data set, demonstrates how the code works and how you can apply this code to the real data set if you want to go out and do that. Have some links here if you're interested in more. I assume you've signed up to this uh, workshop because you are interested in synthetic data, which seems reasonable consumption to make. So there's some uh, blogs, some podcasts, uh, some, you know, different, there's, there's a synthetic data estimation for UK longitudinal studies. There's a, a URL there if you want to follow that. Again, these slides will be made available after the workshop is done. And um, yeah, good. Here are my contact details if you want to talk to me later. And I will now uh, take some questions. So let me stop sharing this. We'll take some questions now and then we'll take a break and I will do the code demonstration after the break. But please uh, do let me know if you have, oh, here's a Q&A. Uh, is synthetic data most of the time predictions? I would say no. All predictions, I think, are probably synthetic data because they're all data points that are generated about something that cannot be observed. So we, we cannot observe the future, at least not yet. I don't know what the crazy cosmology physicists are getting up to. They might be able to, but we can't. And certainly the things we talk about, things like market prices or um, how much demand there will be for school places or these kinds of things, these are predictions and they are generally made through processes that we would think those those points are synthetic. However, there's lots of synthetic data that is not predictions. So I can make a synthetic data set of people height and weight. It's not a prediction. I'm not predicting that anyone will actually have that height and weight combination. But that in that case, synthetic data is just useful for me to create some code or to create a visualization or to create a web interactive platform that lets people see where they might fit in a, a synthetic population or something. What's the best way of sharing high fidelity synthetic data for simulation initial analysis? This is an interesting one. High fidelity synthetic data is generally created for a specific research question. Therefore, you probably are only going to share it with people in your research group. And I would say the best way to do that is through some kind of uh, secure online repository. But if you mean that you have created some high fidelity synthetic data for your work and you think other people will be able to use it beneficially, then I would put it on GitHub or Zenodo or something like that with very good documentation and uh, a DOI, so a digital object identifier, so that other people can find it. They can find exactly the version that you're talking about. They can find exactly the documentation that goes along with that version. Barring that, uh, you might put it on a secure repository, like the UK Data Service, for example, 
and tell people that um, they will have to at least create an account and sign the end user license agreement that they understand that this is synthetic data, that they have read the documentation and that they are going to behave responsibly. So those are some options. How many different methods would you apply for generating synthetic data before determining which is the most appropriate? Um, I would think this depends on your research question and how much access you have to real data if you have real data that you're trying to generate. I would say consider at least three and test them out on a very small scale to see how much computing resources they generate or how much how much computing resources they need to generate a specific volume of synthetic data and how that synthetic data looks and and you know is it something you think is close but not perfect and therefore could improve on or if it's completely bonkers and you don't understand how to use it yep three but that could be a difference between decision trees, decision forest, and clustering or something like that. If you're talking, I know I want to use a machine learning model to create synthetic data. I'll try three different methods of machine learning models. It could mean one machine learning model, one simulation, agent-based model, for example, and one um, random number generated model. So yeah, it depends on how sophisticated your application is what data you already have access to, what computing resources you already have access to. This is not trivial. I'd, I'd say three, um, unless you have a whiz that can test dozens of methods very quickly. Right, moving on. What about a data set that is a mix of observed data and synthetic data? E.g. the 10% of variables are just added columns based on observed data. How do we treat derived variables which make up indices based on transformed real data? Very good question. This is often called augmented, synthetically augmented data sets. And I mean, we should treat it the same that we treat real data or synthetic data. So it, it depends on the purpose you're using it for. If the purpose you're using it for is to substitute or, or cover for the fact that real data is limited, um, then you should just make that very, very clear in the documentation. You should ideally always make it very clear that your synthetic data is synthetic. You can do that by creating very obviously fake names and addresses, or you can do that by creating putting the word synth in front of every, every column, you know, something like that. But in an augmented data set, this sort of mix of real and observational, it's best to just put it in the data, uh, the documentation for the data. So the metadata should all be very clear about how it was generated what features were used to determine whether a, a generated column is fits with the range or distribution of the original or both, or whether it's designed to add confusion around uh, outliers or whether it's designed to just multiply what exists already up to a, a, a certain type, like um, useful size. So yeah, again, clarity. There's there's no downside to being very transparent with what you've done and what decisions you've made and why. Ooh, there's questions on the Padlet. Let me go to that because I did not have that open. How effective is using synthetic data to train machine learning models or LLMs? Could researchers create synthetic data from the cohort study and use it? That's two questions. I'll answer the first. How effective is using th synthetic data to train machine learning models? It is as effective as real data in that you will train the machine. The machine learning model doesn't know it's synthetic or real. How well trained the model is on later using later applications with real data will depend on how good your synthetic data is at mimicking the real world data on the specific things that you're training it to do. So again, this disappointingly, my answer for so much of this is it depends on your research question, <laughs> but it really does. So how effective is it? It's totally effective for training the model, but it will be trained to deal with the data you've given it. If the data you've given it is not very much like the real world data, then it will not be very good at doing the thing you've trained it to do. But if you're synthetic data is quite like the real world data, 
then then it will be fine. So the second part of this is, could researchers create synthetic data from the cohort study and use it? I would say yes, but I would encourage you to read your end user license agreement and make sure that you comply with, with everything that it uh, says. So that may mean that you cannot create and share high fidelity, medium or high fidelity data, but you can probably create and use machine learning or uh, um, synthetic data, but you may not be able to share it depending on the end user license agreement, but you can probably share preview synthetic data. For example, I don't think end user license agreements would prohibit you from doing that, but it has to be obviously fake and quite small scale. So yeah, read your agreements very, very carefully. How can data managers best prepare for the increased creation and use of synthetic data, especially when other researchers wish to create data and share it with others? My advice here is to really make sure that everyone in your group that you're that you're managing the data for understands what synthetic data is and isn't and understands how to create good documentation. Because if we all understand which data is synthetic and which isn't and how the synthetic data was created, there's probably not a problem in people um, increasing the creation and use of it. The problem comes when people don't understand what it is or how it was created or what they're allowed to do or not do. So again, transparency. What are the biggest challenges in generating synthetic data that is really faithful to the real data? The problem there is um, whether you are allowed to share it, I think, and also uh, documenting carefully how you created it in a way that does not heighten the indication risk. So if you're really faithful to the real data, but only on three of the variables, you can say that. You can say these variables, we kept the range very clear, very, very accurately, but the distribution is not. Or we kept these two, the range and the distribution are each allowed to be, um, you know, within, you know, some kind of p-value uh, similarity to each other. However, the relationship between them is not or something like that. You have to be very clear about what you've done and why. If you're planning on sharing it, if you're only planning on creating it for testing purposes and it never goes anywhere and you destroy it afterwards, then the biggest challenge is just knowing that you created the thing accurately that you want to do. But in that case, just use the real data. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, perhaps I'm missing something here. I'll go back. Um, okay. So there's another question in the Q&A. You mentioned predictions are synthetic data. Does that mean estimated regression coefficients using real data, which are used to predict behavior, are also synthetic? Yes. I would say that is an example of a machine learning model that has created synthetic data because linear regression is machine learning. So um, you can all give yourselves a big round of applause for successfully using machine learning models to create synthetic data if you have created <laughs> regression coefficients. Hooray! <laughs> um, so having said that, some of you may have answered some of those questions differently during the presentation. I would, in this case, people probably aren't thinking about it as synthetic data because you're, you're reporting the coefficient in a paper, for example. Um, and it's, you know, that's, that's obviously, you're, you're very clearly describing what you've done and what, what the data looks like in this case, one coefficient. That's probably not the kind of thing you want to helpfully label as synthetic data. But if you were using machine learning models to create a whole range of points and you put those points into a a comma separated value set and you hang that on your website, you should very carefully label that synthetic data and tell them how you created it. How can one measure synthetic data faithfulness? Uh, yeah, this is tricky because you have to say what you did and how you did it. Perhaps this is more, more helpful to address after the code demo because I will show you how to create very low faithfulness synthetic data. 
and increasingly high faithfulness synthetic data. And I would say how you measure its faithfulness is by looking at how it was created. So you should, in theory, share the R or Python code or, I don't know, Stata syntax or whatever, and just share share the code with people and say, look, these are all the steps that I did. You can run those steps yourself and replicate the outcomes. Are indices like the Human Development Index considered synthetic data since they are generated from real data? I would say yes. I don't know enough about it to be very like super confident. I'm not going to bang the table and be like, my answer is the answer. But if it's generated from real data, then I would say, yeah, it's it's a synthetic data point. Again, it's like a prediction. If you're only creating one point and you're saying this is our uh, regression model, this is our prediction, this is our single estimation, it is synthetic, but it's maybe not helpful to talk about that as synthetic in the way that people usually talk about synthetic data. But you all have the inside scoop. It is synthetic. Under what circumstances can a researcher fully resort to using synthetic data? Um, I would think the, the rare or unethical or um, extremely hard to come by circumstances are, are one that researchers can just use synthetic data. Um, because there's a very good reason that you cannot use real data. And you can just be quite honest about that. You can say, we're not waiting for 100 Category 5 hurricanes before we do research on Category 5 hurricanes. We're going to synthesize them and do some research now. We're not going to subject children to unethical uh, like development situations. We're just going to synthesize it. So in these cases, just be quite honest. In other cases where the, the data is hard to get but not impossible, again, you can just use synthetic data as a sort of proof of concept, maybe to apply for grant funding or, or use that to apply for permission to get the real data. You can say, look, we, we have this research question. We created a synthetic data set. Our synthetic data set shows these kinds of outputs. We'd like to apply our method to the real data but look how useful it could be based on our synthetic version. That's That proof of concept is still valid research. So if that's a case where a researcher would just use synthetic data. Swap back to the Padlet. Doesn't look like there's any new questions here. So I think that's all of our questions. Um, we can take a break. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. What time do we want to come back, Christina? We have a break until half past. Um, half past, right. Yes. So we are getting almost 20 minutes. We almost 20. Coffee. Ooh, there's another question. I'll just answer this one. But everyone else, go ahead, go get a coffee, go stretch your legs, go, you know, scruffle the dog's ears, whatever you need to do. Uh, can all synthetic data, including high fidelity, be considered non-personal, i.e. not subject to GDPR? I would say yes. However, I am not an expert on this particular question. I would say you need to be very careful to read the terms of any data, real data that you're using. If you're not using real data, if you have just created an agent-based model, for example, and you know created it, and there's no real data going into that, then you're fine. It's not personal because there's no people involved. If you're creating it based on machine learning models, you have to carefully read the machine learning models to make sure that they are internalizing pattern recognitions and not recreating real data in their answers. So this is, yeah, it gets a little bit tricky. Um, you have to be very sure of how the machine learning model is working before you can be confident that it's not just stealing real answers and presenting them as, as synthetic. Um, this is a, a problem for can trademarks. I something, yeah. Jules, here? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I, I think uh, there is a debate going on uh, um, whether high fidelity data is subject to GDPR or not. And I have read many papers on that. Yeah. And it's debatable, but... Um, 
I think it does if there is disclosable disclose. I'm I I'm sorry I can't pronounce yeah, it. There disclosure, is a discl yeah. yeah, disclosure risk in there and high fidelity data. You never know if yeah. um it depends if you have used names uh, there, yeah. if you have used audio yeah. recordings or whatever video footages, yeah. and then if it is disclosive, then yes, it is subject yeah. to GDPR. In theory, synthetic data has no disclosure risk. But I would say that people are not using the term indication risk, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah, <laughs> they're, yeah, that's they're where using I, disclosure I got risk confused. To mean yeah, multiple that's where, things. Yeah. yeah, that's where I got confused because on yeah with the health data, they yeah. they do say that high fidelity data is subject to GDPR yeah. because it is disclosive. So yeah, I, I, I'm not an yeah. uh, expert on synthetic data, but uh, this yeah. is what I have read. Yeah, it's it's a rapidly <laughs> evolving area and the terminology is also rapidly evolving. So I would emphasize, yes, in theory, even high fidelity data, if it's created properly, is not disclosure risk, but there's still an indication risk. And that could put people in danger if your data is very sensitive. So if you're talking health data or um, school attainment data or uh, you know some kind of like refugee status and HIV status data this is not things you want to even indicate that there is a real world person out there who meets these five criteria because someone with a malicious intent could go looking for someone with those five criteria so yes I would say if there's any indication risk you think in your data then treat it as if it was subject to GDPR until you can prove that it is not. Which is a lot of burden on you as a researcher, but um, we don't get into this because it's easy, right? <laughs> yeah, no, we're still such a developing, evolving yeah. Yeah. guild. There's so many debates as well. I think from a from a data manager perspective, what, what's really important to bear in mind is if you are creating that synthetic data, are you creating the synthetic data from the personal data? If it's effectively anonymized, we, we, we don't worry about that. But if it's the personal data, the new KGDPR actually applies because that's a processing that you're doing. You're creating the synthetic data. But yeah. again, on, on our end with UKDS, we take the view if high fidelity synthetic data is created properly and all the checks are in place, there is no disclosure risk. That's the view that we we are taking. But again, it, yeah. it's something that keeps being reviewed and there's a, yeah. there's a lot of burden on you. But that's why I said in the chat as well, Please do get in touch with any such questions that, that arise or if other researchers wish to create synthetic data from your data, because then, well, we add copyright considerations as well. It can get yeah. complicated very fast. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. 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 And that's that's a really good point to consider. I mean, I did talk about all the uses for synthetic data, and some of those are very internally focused. And so there's not an issue about sharing. But some of them are very externally focused, like presentation or creating training data. These you have to be much more careful with because you're expecting them to be very widely used, very widely seen. They should be treated much more carefully, certainly than something that you're creating very quickly to test if your code throws up an error, you know, and you're you're going to destroy this data set afterwards or or something like that. <laughs> These so Consider your research questions, your method of generation, and the purpose to which it is being put. All of these things will help you determine how to treat your data, which might be very, very carefully, or it might be very trivially. <laughs> Hello again. Um, I will share my screen again, and this time I will share my browser because we are going to look at the code notebook that I created on how to create synthetic data. So let me share my screen. Okay. And first off, I want to point out, oh, let me clear this. That doesn't need to be in my view. Um, so th 
First, I want to point out is the GitHub repository that the UK Data Service shares all of our code notebooks, all of the computational social science. So that's the team that I lead. We do a lot of code notebooks, um, and these are repositories where we have samples of code. Often you can run them directly in the browser, but sometimes it's useful to uh, download the zip file, for example, open up open with GitHub desktop if you have it, or you can clone the repository and you could then get a copy of all of these files on your local computer and you can work through the code examples in your own time, assuming you have um, a Jupyter Notebooks installation, which you may or may not have. But today we're going to look at the synthetic data one. Now, the first time we ran a workshop on synthetic data was 2021. I also ran some last year in 2023, but this is 2024. So we're going into the 2024, the subcategory. Uh, so we'll be opening this code demo basics. Now I have this open in Jupyter Notebooks on my computer. So I will be able to run through these um, as we work through them on my computer. If you want to do this, you will need to clone or download the zip and run it on your computer. Try to get it in Google Colab so that people can just run it in their browser and it was not working. I need to figure out Google Colab. Uh, it is so far not my favorite. Um, but anyway, so here's the code notebook that I'll be using. And the first thing, I have already run this code cell because you can see it has uh, a number one here because it has, it's the first cell that I've run. And this is just to import and download and install all the things. It takes a little while and there's all this gobbledygook at the bottom. So I've done that in advance of actually working through the rest of the data. So now we need to import the data that we're going to work with. And the data, as you can probably guess from my presentation in PowerPoint. Uh, I'm going to use a fairly trivial um, data set and we're going to show you how easy-ish it is to create a synthetic version. So I'm using a height and weight data set. Um, it is provided in the Google, uh, the, sorry, the GitHub repository. It's called heightweight.csv and I'm importing it as a file called heightweight original or HW original. So to run this cell, I'm going to hold down control and click enter. You can, of course, click in the cell and then click run if you want to run it in your own time. I'm not going to tell you too much about the mechanics of Jupyter Notebooks because either you will have it installed and know how to use it or you won't. Um, so let's check the data. The first part of creating any synthetic data set is understanding the data that you're trying to synthesize. So let's look at this. We run this cell and it gives us a very brief uh, introduction. So the first five rows and the last five rows, we can see that there's three columns, gender, height, and weight. And we can see the kind of level of precision that are included in the original data. And we can see that gender, for example, is coded as male and female, both with capital letters, rather than zero and one or anything else that might you know, potentially be there. Uh, another way to check data, if you want to see the first 10 rows, for example, is to, let's go down here, let's run this. Oh, why did my, I need a better scroll function. Uh, in this case, we see the first 10 rows because I have called for 10. There is some extra credit work here. Uh, in these. So if you want to work through these notebooks, there's a few additional points, both about how Jupyter Notebooks works and how this data works that you can work through on your own time. I'm not going to worry too much about it. So exploring the data. We don't just want to know that it has Im imported properly, and we want to know more than just what the first five rows of data look like. So let's look at the columns. For example, we get a list of the columns. They're called gender, height, and weight. We kind of already knew that. It's fine. But how about some info? Again, my computer really needs to learn how to scroll a bit more effectively. Uh, in this case, we see that they are all, we see the name of the column, how many values, the fact that there's no non, um, null, you know, that, that all of the columns and all of the rows 
have an intersecting point. There's no missing values. And we can see that the first gender column is an object, but that the height and weight are floats. This means that they're numbers, essentially. Um, so there's some useful, you know, information about the data set. It is important to know that before you go recreating it, because otherwise you will be wondering why is this thing happening? If, for example, there's no null values, or if you're trying to create random numbers to fill in a categorical variable. Now, data descriptives. This, if you're working in data, you understand how descriptives work. They're important. Um, so the first one we have is just the name of the thing and then describe. Um, oh, that should be a markdown rather than a code cell, I think. Let me just change that. Yes. Um, so, oh, there should be a code cell there, though, however, uh, in which I do the name of the thing and then describe. Oh no, here it is. For some reason it's down here. Ah, yeah. So this one, this time I'm grouping by gender and hitting describe. So this time, instead of giving me a description like the mean, standard deviation, min and max of all of the data, I have split it into male and female, and it's giving me a mean, standard deviation, min, max, all these kind of things for height and weight by gender. This is useful. I will fix this code cell, the missing describe code cell before I uh, before tomorrow. <laughs> I'll do that later today. But the real point is that you can get good descriptives of your existing data, and that will be useful for knowing how faithful your synthetic data is about value counts. Uh, it's Im probably important to know that our data set has 5,000 of each. Um, you know, this is a data set I got off the interweb. It is not very realistic in that there is no unknown or non-binary or intersex or other all of these people are either male or female, and that is perhaps not entirely realistic. Moving on, <laughs> there's another extra credit uh, cell there. Now, visualizations is another good way to understand the data that you have. And that's very useful when you're going to synthesize because you want to be able to compare the visualizations. So a basic scatter plot, height and weight. Ooh, isn't that nice? A uh, nice big blue smush showing us the relationship between height and weight. Now, probably it's more useful if we do that in color with the genders colored differently. Here we go. So this time we can see that the smush is actually composed of two smushes. That's the technical term. Uh, so yellow and purple. Hopefully that is not um, a problem for anyone with vision differences. Uh, I didn't double check to make sure my graphs are colorblind compliant. Sorry. Um, but let's look at um, some other scatter plots. Let's see. Is this in? So this one, rather than just being all a smush, is. Uh... Oh. The point here is that I'm using a different visualization package. This is not especially useful for this demonstration, but I do want to point out that different visualization packages will present different visualizations. And therefore, uh, you have to be aware of that. If you're going to, for example, publish these, you do want to be very, very clear about what packages and what code you have used to create the visualizations. Ideally, all of the code underpinning your visualization creation would also be available online if you're going to publish something, for example, um, because they look differently depending on the, the packages you've used. Um, so distributions. We know from looking at those scatter plots a bit about how they're distributed. You know that there's a big smush which is bigger in the middle and that it is dependent on gender, but how about we break it into 30 bins? 
and we get a nice histogram. Again, with the automatically scrolling would have been nice. So here's our histogram for height with 30 bins. It's pretty bell-shaped, I think we can all agree. Um, I mean, I would be unhappy if my bell had exactly this shape, but uh, it's reasonable. How about weight? Let's break weight into 30 bins and see what that looks like. Oh, this is no longer so bell-shaped. This is clearly bimodal now. We've got some splaining to do. So let's try again with histogram of the distribution for height and weight, uh, but split by gender, because I suspect that's where the bimodal distribution comes in. And it looks like I was probably correct. So when we split by gender, we no longer have a single bell curve. We now have two bell curves. This is not surprising. Uh, height and weight are pretty basic characteristics. And, um, you know, we can see that there's there's clearly a split in the distribution here. This is good to know. Um, but maybe we want to know a bit more specifically which distribution our data fits. So let's get some common distributions that it might be. So you're probably familiar with normal distribution, power law distribution, uniform, you know, all of these kinds of things. Um, it's good to know. So let's compare the 10 most common distributions, these that I've listed here. So let's get for our data, we will find the best fit distribution for male height, male weight, female height, and female weight. So we run that and I have stored the results in a list and then I will print that list. So for each distribution in that list, what is the best fit distribution? And it's running, it's running, it's thinking, and it tells me we have normal, normal, gamma, and normal. Huh. So women's height is not a normal distribution disappointed. But we can just treat it as if it's normal for the purposes of this uh, demonstration, although extra credit work if you want to fit a gamma distribution instead. So now on to creating synthetic data. And we will start with low. And I do, if you want to work through all of these um, Jupyter notebooks, I do encourage you to read these little text things that I am jumping over. I am leaping over them like a pole vault. Uh, but they are useful if you want to understand this much more carefully, much more in depth. But I figure you are all capable of reading and you do not need to read out text to you because that is boring. So instead I will charge ahead and just get on with creating the data. So the lowest fidelity option that I could think to make is to create a pandas data frame uh, with random numbers, just random. So what do we have in gender? We have a bunch of negative numbers. What does that even mean? I mean, people are talking about new genders in the modern era. Here we've got a whole load of them. Also height and weight, unrealistic. So we've got tiny people that weigh a lot. We've got people with negative heights and negative weights. It's, it's a nonsense. But it does have the right number of columns. They are called the right things. Uh, so we're not totally unfaithful. We're just, you know, it's it's not very faithful. <laughs> I think we can all agree. And if we create a scatter plot, um, we can see that it looks very unlike our scatter plots of the real data. Uh, and just as a safety measure, I mean, it's extremely unlikely, but I'm going to compare the real data and this lowest fidelity data to make sure that no two rows match. They do not match. You will be shocked to hear. <laughs> so now going on to low-ish fidelity, still very low, but not the lowest possible. And so in this case, I create another pandas data frame with NumPy arrays that are 100 digits long. And this time they're within a range of 10 to 100. 
So I have specified range, but otherwise they're still just random numbers. Now it is more realistic in that we no longer have negative height and weight. Uh, however, it's still unrealistic in that people are given numerical genders, which I, I, I'm not aware of that being a real world thing. Uh, so here again, our scatter plot looks very little like our uh, scatter plot from the real data, but at least it is not negative. <laughs> Again, I run the equals test. I'm expecting it to say false. It does say false <laughs> because it's very low fidelity. Okay. Um, now, the third low fidelity option, I'm calling it low rather than lowest or low-ish. And in this case, I'm again creating another pandas data frame. But now only two columns will be random values, for, and those will be the height and weight. The, so two random numerical values drawn from a uniform distribution within min and max that we found earlier in our data. So one column will be 50 male and 50 female. So I now have male and female in the gender column. Height and weight will be random drawn from the distributions. Let's have a look. Okay, so we can see here, let me go up one, height, weight, gender. Okay, in this case, gender is at the end. So that's one way that it is not like our original, uh, but it is more like our original in that male and female are now the categories in that column instead of random numbers. Again, let's just have a quick check the scatter plot. So not very like our real data but it is at least not a rainbow of colors. There are only two genders in this, and that is one way that it is more like our real data. Now, this is probably sufficient if you're just making sure that your code identifies uh, missing values, identifies numbers in your categorical variable column, that your code can plot, that your code can put things in the right number of bins and like create a visualization. So this very low fidelity, very fast to create synthetic data might be enough depending on your purposes. It might not be. Again, no line in this synthetic data set equals a line in our real data set. Not surprising, but it's always worth checking. So now we're going on to medium fidelity. Medium fidelity is done in several ways. Um, I'm going to use a simple regression model of the data and I will use the output of that, um, the mean and standard deviation from the height of the real data to generate matching synthetic data points. So let's do this. So I have switched gender, I've put zeros because uh, regression models work better with numerical categories than they do with named categories. For whatever reason in Pandas, this might be a step that you don't need to take if you're using a different set of software or a different statistical package and yours doesn't have a problem with words. Mine did for whatever reason, it kept giving me stupid answers and this was the stupid solution that it wanted. Now this is useful because if I were creating this in a realistic setting, I would simply write in my documentation that I have switched gender from male to female and female to zero and one. And here's the translation that I used. Um, again, just, just put it transparently in your documentation and your metadata, and then people won't have a problem with it in theory. <laughs> so we can see here that we've got gender zero and one, we've got height, we've got weight. Um, this is reasonably realistic looking, at least so far. Uh, let's create a, um, so we've got a, a mean and standard deviation for height from the numerically transformed data. We convert it into an array. So in this case, I am sort of, I've created synthetic height and weight, and then I'm going to build a regression model on my real data 
and then apply that regression model to the height that I have created and use it to overwrite the weight. So the heights are still random. The weights are now based on the regression model's relationship between height and weight, if that makes sense. There's my model. It's just a number. It's not very helpful. And if we get, this is the part where it overwrites. Again, uh, I do want to point out to you that you will get much more out of this code notebook if you go through and read all of the sections. I'm just whizzing through here, executing the code cells uh, to show you the big picture stuff. If you want to understand the nitty gritty, please do uh, use the whole code cell, uh, the whole code process. So in this case, I have um, rerun. So here I now have my generated heights and I have no generated weights yet. And this is where I create the predictions for weights. And I, let's have a look at the scatter plot. Oh, it's preserved the relationship, but it's not very realistic, is it? This is, this is a point to consider. This is another way to il illustrate that you can be more faithful in some ways and less faithful in other ways. By taking a particular step, you will be more faithful and less faithful. That is a mind bender if you ever had one. <laughs> but again, as long as you're clear about the steps you've taken and the choices you made, that is what matters for uh, documentation reproducibility purposes. Again, a quick step just to make sure that none of my synthetic data matches my original data. It does not. We are not surprised because looking at this scatter plot, this is not very realistic. So we know that it's not very realistic. The way to approach this is to add noise at various steps in there so that they don't sit just unrealistically on that uh, linear regression model line. So we do more or less the same thing. We already have the regression models we made based on the real data. So this time, when we create the synthetic versions, we will create 50, 0, and 51. So that's our gender column. We create a random normally distributed height based on the mean and standard distribution of the real data, 100 of them long. So it matches this. It's the same length as our gender column. Weight will be filled with nothing for the moment. And uh, I've put some noise around the random generation. Um, don't want to get too far into this right now. Just, just know that we're doing more or less the same thing as at their first medium fidelity, but this time with noise. Ah, here we go. So we've got a noise column got height, weight. This is good. Let's do a scatter plot. Aha. Uh -huh. So see, this is, this is better. This is much better. And for many research purposes, this might be all that you need to do. So it's still trivial up to this point. I mean, it took me a couple of days to do develop this because I had to make sure my code runs and make sure that I put my commas in the right place. But somebody who's used to working in Python or R can probably do this level of synthetic data generation quite quickly. Again, let's just test and see, do any of our lines match the real data? They do not. Uh, so let's go on to our most sophisticated synthetic data version. This time, I have created um, regression models based on the different genders. So the um, instead of just using the relationship between height and weight that I saw in the big original, this time I'm going to create specific values for the uh, male height mean, male height standard deviation, male height minimum and male weight minimum. Maximum, I'm not too worried about. And then I'm going to create some arrays of random numbers and use those relationships to transform the outputs. And I'll add in some noise and I won't bore you by going through all the code details because again, you can look this up, this code notebook, you can go through it very slowly if you like. 
uh, and this time we'll do the steps and we'll do it for male and female. And let's have a look at what it creates. Okay, so, I mean, the relationships there, it's not directly on the regression line, but it's still very strong. Maybe this is better for your purposes. Maybe it is not. It doesn't look very much like our real data. So that is something that we need to think, is it important that the synthetic version be very like the real data and in what way? Is it important that the mean be the same, that the minimum and maximum be the same, that the relationship be the same? Because you can't have it be the same on all of these. And just to double check, uh, are there any matches? <laughs> there are not. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to take some questions now and assume that people have questions about some of this. Um, are these real data or synthetic data on height weight? The inputs that I used, I've labeled them original because they are actually synthetic. I got them directly off of Kaggle, which is a repository for data sets on the internet. And it is not, because I didn't want, because I'm doing this for demonstration purposes, I expect these repositories and this code and this video to be accessible to the public. I wanted to demonstrate that for public facing stuff, you should always use uh, things that are fine for public facing stuff. In this case, the easiest way for me was to use synthetic data from Kaggle. And then I create a synthetic version uh, as you saw. Now it is important to note that Kaggle's is much more realistic than mine. But Kaggle, whoever created the original uh, data set and posted it on Kaggle, probably did not make it in one code notebook in a couple of days. <laughs> so I want to show you different ways to create it in increasing levels of difficulty, because maybe all you need is the first one. Maybe all you need is the middle one. Maybe you want to go beyond the most sophisticated one that I've shown you. But by showing you these steps from trivially simplistic synthetic up through, well, you know, it's getting there. Um, I wanted to show you what kind of steps you take, what kind of choices you make, make in each of these steps and what the outcome does. Uh, so yes, useful question. Uh, these were all synthetic. If you generate a data point that is the same as the real data point, do you... Be, I'm assuming that's begin the data generation process again, or just drop the points that have a real equivalent. This is a point, this is a, something you need to consider as the creator of the data. I would even go so far as to say, if I generate a synthetic point that is exactly like a real data point on some features, but not others, I wouldn't even throw that out unless that point is in the outliers region. So this is a really complex relationship about what counts as a match. So uh, certainly I would not want to replicate, to accidentally replicate someone's name, occupation, and postcode, because that is quite, <laughs> that's quite uncomfortable. But if I exactly replicated someone's height and weight, but they were very central tendency, I wouldn't necessarily throw that out. Uh, and these are the things you need to be clear about your choices, it needs to be clear in your documentation, it needs to be clear in your code. Um, how can we treat missing values in the original data? Should they be kept in the synthetic data? Uh, this depends on your purpose. If your purpose is to create very useful uh, outputs, you probably want to drop the missing values in both the real and synthetic, you know. There's no point including something in the data input if you're not going to show it in the output, but you could just leave it. If your purpose is testing to make sure that your code doesn't um, clunk and you know give you a frowny face, then definitely keep the missing values because if that's something that's going to make your real code go clunk, you want to make sure that you have tested appropriately what your your computer will do, your code will do if it hits those kind of errors. 
Um, I'm going to stop sharing so that you can see my face extra big. Um, but yeah, this, so this, again, I, I give the irritating answer of like, it really depends on your research question, the use for which you're creating the data, the features of your real data, um, whether you're planning on sharing this or not. All of these things will help you answer these questions. But yeah, there are some cases in which I would chuck out the missing values of both real and synthetic data. And there are some cases where I would keep the missing values of real and synthetic data. If you're trying to use the, if you're trying to develop a machine learning model, for example, that identifies whether missing values are likely to be related to native speaker of native language of this, the a respondent, for example, because maybe that will help you identify, are people not answering this question because they don't understand it? Then I would keep those missing values and I would try and create a, a computer model that identifies all the features that go into why someone may or may not answer this question. Is this question quite personal or quite a new concept or a complicated question? These are all things that might lead someone to not answering it. Therefore, that missing value is actually a very interesting data point for some questions, but not for others. <laughs> All right. Um, any other questions? Let me check the Padlet because I don't have that up on screen. Oh, there is some more questions here. Oh, no, those are answers from Christina. <laughs> uh, okay. Is there a particular reason you chose Jupiter and Python? Are there specific benefits? No, not particularly. I could, I could have created this demonstration in R, and I am actually looking to create some asynchronous learning materials on synthetic data. That is to say, materials that someone works through in their own time and pace um, that sort of live online and people can sign up to them and take them and, and finish them or not as needed. And when I create those, I will do an R version and a Python version because those are the most common languages. Um, I use both of those languages, but I chose Jupyter, Notebooks, and Python because um, because of how easy it is for me to create uh, text cells and then code cells that are executable in the, the one document. Could have done that with R Markdown. Uh, I didn't. I, I will someday. <laughs> Soon? <laughs> Maybe within the next year? Are there tools or techniques for generating synthetic data that you would advise for using besides the demo ones? So yeah, there's if you want to recreate specific features of a data set, like realistic G, uh, email addresses or realistic postcode uh, addresses or something like that, there are tools, both packages that you can import into R or Python that can help you with that. So Synthpop and Faker and Mockaroo, I think... I'm not sure which of these are packages and if so, which languages they are or whether they're web platforms that you can um, put your criteria into and it spits out some answers. But there are tools and techniques for generating specific kind of stuff. However, those only work if you're going to use, if you're going to recreate something that's fairly well understood. Um, so names and addresses and email addresses, for example, we we can we we can look at these and know it has the structure of a UK postal address. It has the structure of an email address. It has the you know structure of a telephone number. These are well understood, and therefore they're kind of trivial to make. Um, so they may not be. Well, there there are tools and techniques for generating specific things. If you're the first mover in a new area, there's unlikely to be tools that are very useful for you. So if you're trying to create synthetic images that show uh, maybe how someone's hip responds to different kinds of physiotherapy, I don't know that anyone's done that yet. Um, it might be you. You're the one that has to make the tool. <laughs> um, what are the biggest challenges... Uh, Oh, no, we already answered that one. Okay. So there's no more questions in the 
Padlet. We do have one in the Q&A. Do you have any thoughts on using multiple imputation software to impute novel cases and which might have missing data in the original? I don't have any thoughts, but uh, if you have, so mice, multiple imputation software to impute novel cases. This sounds a little bit like the augmentation that we covered uh, before. So you have a certain amount of real data, but there are some problems with it and you wanna create synthetic rows or synthetic values. Yeah, imputation is, is pretty well uh, understood in terms of uh, large real data sets. So I would follow the guidance based on real data. You know, how do you impute missing values? for real data? Do you take the mean? Do you take, you know, some kind of random number? Do you, you know, there's, there's reasons to choose one or the other. Again, and irritatingly, I'm sure I will say, as long as you're very clear in your documentation about what choices you made and why, uh, there's not really a wrong choice. <laughs> People might disagree with me on that, <laughs> but I think clarity over the reasoning is more important than the actual choice you make, at least most of the time, because then someone else can use all of your code and make a different choice at that specific point, but they know exactly where to change that choice if they want to make a different choice. Um, so yes, clarity. Uh, so the response here is yes, synthetic rows and then drop the original data, mice is in R. Okay, so that's a library in R. Yeah, I mean, this is this is realistic. This is how augmented data works. And it is a step up from simple imputation. So simply filling in a missing one missing value in an otherwise complete row. It's it does get a little bit complicated when you move into hybrid kind of data in this way, because people have been creating real data sets with imputed values. I think as long as they've been sharing real data sets, like people just correct errors according to their method of correcting errors. Um, I would say more real data sets need to be very clear about how they did this. If you're going to do this, follow the best practice on imputation, mark it very clearly, or create an entire synthetic data set that you can merge with your real data set for some research purposes and not merge for sharing purposes. These these are potential ex avenues of exploration, depending on the, the features of your research question, your data, your synthetic generation method. Um, yeah, I think if you're correcting multiple missing values in the same row, then it, you're you're getting into the territory where real data is hard to get or or impossible to get at the level of precision that you want, and synthetic data is probably a very useful avenue of exploration. Right. Uh, there was a question that we didn't quite get to earlier. You mentioned that synthetic data has no disclosure risk. What would then be useful for privacy tests? I have no idea. I don't really know what the, you mean by privacy tests in this case. Uh, I, I would say there is still risk of indication. So you definitely don't want to accidentally recreate a person that is very like a real person in the outlier areas. And if you have lots of variables, somebody will probably be an outlier in at least one of those, like, if you've only got height and weight, most people are going to be central tendency. They're going to be in the middle of that blob. There's very few outliers, really. But if you have 16 variables, especially if you're preserving relationships between variables, you're, the amount of people in the outlier region becomes much higher. So you need to think about that when you're creating your synthetic data. What variables, what relationships are you preserving? How accurately? How are you checking to make sure that you're not creating outlier people that indicate a real person? Yeah, the data we demonstrated with was independent, not longitudinal, very, very well pointed out. How does data generation change? Would it be a stepwise approach with time? So I would say 
a very useful way of creating longitudinal synthetic data would be an agent-based model uh, because you can create essentially synthetic people and you give them rules about how they go about their lives and then you let them go about their synthetic lives and you observe their synthetic lives and you can do that at whatever time frequency you want. Agent-based models are not super difficult to create, uh, but they are not trivial if you're going to be very realistic on lots of features. Um, we actually have a agent-based model training series that we did at the UK Data Service. It's on our YouTube channel. There's a um, GitHub repository as well for it. I would say that time quickly becomes a interacting factor in uh, our data set. So for example, we have our height and weight uh, data set that we've created. If we wanted to look at how that changes over time, we would need to rewrite our rules so that the height is preserved and you start creating um, regression models that impute weight values at weight 0.1 in time, weight at 0.2 in time, weight at 0.3 in time. And the regression models used to create those subsequent points in time would need to account for the passage of time. So the same, you wouldn't use the same basic regression model for a whole population. You would need to build a regression model based on age or some kind of other interacting features like health conditions or occupation or, you know, location or whatever it is that you think is going to play out there. And then you would use your more sophisticated regression models for more sophisticated points in time. Uh, yeah, thanks again, Christina, for sharing the links to the cipher, because that is a good example of how a simulated population, I don't know that they used agent-based modeling specifically, but they might have, was created, was linked to the creation of a synthetic data set, because you just observe your simulated people at multiple points in time, and you bingo, bango, you've got your longitudinal data. Again, bingo, bango being the technical term. <laughs> All right, any more questions? Let me check the Padlet again. Uh, ooh, are there ethical considerations we should be aware of when creating or approving the sharing of data? I mean, all of the ethical considerations that you would look at for collecting and sharing data, you would still want to look at for creating uh, synthetic data. Like, is it helpful? Does it does it help us answer the research question? Is it realistic to to think that creating and you sharing this data will be beneficial? Are there any risks involved? Or are there any chances that people might misuse it? You need to think about all the same things. But because there aren't real people, so some things will be much easier. For example, if I'm going to create a synthetic population and observe them over time, I don't have to worry that um, a vulnerable person in my synthetic population will experience some kind of um, unfair access to my interview room, you know. So there are, in some ways, it's much easier. In some ways, it's much harder because convincing someone else that these ethics, ethical questions are not applicable to synthetic data is not always easy because people don't understand what synthetic data is or isn't. Sometimes people are just, just say no to it because they think it's all problematic. And that's an ethical consideration you will need to overcome through better communication. Uh, someone says cipher data is not longitudinal, even though it is based on a longitudinal data set. Is that correct? I haven't explored the cipher data set in depth, but I thought it was longitudinal, that they have created a synthetic longitudinal data set. Uh, let me know if that's wrong, Christina. But it's based on longitudinal data and it is itself longitudinal. Although it can be used for longitudinal analysis because with the cipher synthetic population, they provide low level geographies for the population within understanding society. So it can be used for longitudinal analysis, but it's simply a, a static file, just the one. Oh, right. Okay. But there aren't like time points or whatever for the different things. No, okay. no, just the just the one. 
Well, that is a gap in the market that maybe some, someone will try and fill. <laughs> but the way they created it potentially could be used to create longitudinal data. If you have a synthetic population, you can just let time run on in your synthesized world and take another, um, you know, synthetic survey. If you're interested, I can talk to you about agent-based modeling and how that uh, works. Um, it's a bit of a left turn <laughs> from the rest of this presentation, but we can we can talk more about it if you're interested, or you can reach out to me separately because agent-based modeling is what I did my is is the method I used for my PhD thesis. I have a lot to say. <laughs> Maybe it's too much. <laughs> But um, have we got, we've got another like, what, 14 minutes? So we can hang out and answer questions. Or I can show you some agent-based modeling if you like. <laughs> Would love to hear about agent-based modeling. Great. <laughs> Let's, uh, let me do a quick thing. I'm sure I have net logo still installed. Do I? I may not. Net logo. So NetLogo is a free agent-based modeling um, software. If I share my screen, let me go back to Zoom, share my screen. Okay. So this is uh, NetLogo. It's from Northwestern University. It's been going quite a while. You can download it, a very lightweight, very small uh, application, or you can use it on the web, which is what I'll do here. There's a lot of um, sample models in the models library. Um, I'll use the traffic grid, for example. And there's all these different features. How big is the grid? How many cars? Um, how many sort of time steps? You can say that's days. You can say it's years. In this case, it's probably minutes or something like that. Um, and then you can sort of run it. Let's see if I can actually run it in the web. Uh, but they create these. So this is the virtual world, this little black box. Um, if I set up, if I hit set up, it creates a virtual world, in this case, a city center, you know, sort of grid system. And if I hit go, the little cars move around, stopping at red lights, going at green lights. They follow rules about how fast they accelerate and how fast they go. So you can see all these sort of graphics emerge, the average speed of cars, how long they're waiting on average. And you can sort of change all these things so that there's far fewer cars set up, go. And you can see again, the, the how many cars are stopped, what's their average speed, what's their wait time, all of these things are dynamic. Now this is quite trivial because there, this is a grid and they're all you know, the same kind of car and they're all doing the exact same behavior, but you could make it more sophisticated so that there's cars and lorries and motorcycles and bikes and uh, that some people are in a hurry and some people are quite patient. You could change all of this if you wanted. But this is a useful example of how if you create a virtual world and you control how many people are in that world and what rules they follow, then you can observe some things like what's the average uh, speed of cars at different points in time. What's the average, you know, how long are they waiting? So if you wanted to, here's one for voting, here's one for uh, minorities and how they tend, I think, to move to neighborhoods where people of that minority already live. So all the different kinds of questions you might want to ask. Uh, here's language change, segregation models, two persons prisoners dilemma so there's all these different models that already exist you can just play around with on the web no downloading required if you want to build your own however you will want to download netlogo build one of these little uh virtual worlds perhaps with people who you know make choices about their career and then that feeds into what how their income goes and that contributes to where they decide to move next and all of these features that maybe you're interested in Someone has asked, would I suggest using Python Faker library for generating synthetic data? It is certainly a option. Faker is a good library. It's uh, well-established. People like it. 
I don't tend to create the kind of synthetic data sets where it's useful to me, but I know other people have used it and they found it useful. And NetLogo looks fascinating. I really love NetLogo. I could talk a lot about it. I'm glad you like it. Do let me know. Reach out to me if you want to um, learn more about it and, you know, the kinds of things. I built one in which greenhouse farmers had to gossip about how well their businesses were doing and then they choose they chose to buy technology based on what their neighbors had bought and there's and so there's this whole like social contagion uh productivity competition thing going on it was quite sophisticated and it showed some very interesting things and when i presented the results to the greenhouse farmers they're like oh yeah that one over there that's that's hurt because he never buys anything new until everybody else has it first so they were able to understand the relationships and the behaviors they could see themselves in the synthetic people but in a way that didn't involve them having to answer questions every time they bought a new piece of equipment so yeah i'll uh, stop sharing uh we've still got some time we've got eight minutes you can uh, talk more if you like or you can leave early flip up the table go out to lunch Just one thing that came up in the in the menti as we've started the session, a lot of people were wondering, can synthetic data replace real data? Yeah. Um, how can synthetic data yeah. replace real data and so on? I don't know if you'd if you'd like to No, uh, that's a good one. have a few minutes though. Yeah. It uh can replace real data in some contexts. So the context, for example, where real data is simply not available or is simply too complex or expensive to get at the volumes you need, use synthetic data. Be clear about how how you made the synthetic data and why you're using it. But otherwise, you know, the other option is not doing the research. And that's usually not the best option. Uh, other options in which synthetic data can replace real data are proof of concept, uh, previews, uh, teaching, things like that. So anything where the real data is inappropriate to share or to share widely or to share between institutions because maybe only one institution has permission to hold it. In this case, synthetic data is the practical and useful thing for some contexts. It is not appropriate to use synthetic data to draw conclusions with far-reaching consequences if real data is available but um like if you could get the real data then use the real data to support your your actual decision making um so for example i wouldn't encourage policymakers to use synthetic data to underpin their uh, you know, tax choices or something like that's use the real data. <laughs> but for researchers who may not have access to the real data or who use it as some of the steps in their process, synthetic data can be used for real data. It needs to be clear that it's synthetic. The choices behind why you're using it instead of the real data need to be clear, but it can be appropriate. Are there some go-to methods, packages for validating the synthetic data produced by something like NetLogo? Um, I mean, however you validate real data, you would validate synthetic data in that way. So you would get your descriptive statistics, you would compare, you know, to your best estimates of, of populations and samples and, you know, all of these things. The difference between synthetic data created by NetLogo, for example, is that you can record the entire output of the model and make that available to someone. Um, you can also record the random seed, for example, that was used to generate a particular run. So someone could recreate your particular run exactly. Um, in that case, it's it depends on what you're trying to validate. If you want to validate the results of your research, uh, you would do that as you would any research. If you're trying to validate why this model is created in a way that's useful, you need to create show how the outputs from the model match the expectations from the real world. And that's, you know, you would need to explain, for example, why you chose in the traffic model 
the acceleration rates that you did. So that should be based on real world acceleration rates. For example, you would say diesel cars can accelerate at this rate, electrical cars at that, at that rate. Um, you know, SUVs speed up differently than mopeds. You would have to have all these factors somewhere in your research and they should be well documented. Uh, someone says, I think it is important to stress for the reasons mentioned that synthetic data is meant for simulations only. Something, as you mentioned, not always clear for non-research audiences. Yes, always. I think it's important. Always be as transparent as you can with what you're doing and why. And one of the valuable things about synthetic data is that you can document how it was made. And that is not true in the same way for how you took surveys. You know, you can write down, well, we had these people and they were trained in this way and they went out and conducted these surveys and they lasted this long. But that's very different than saying, here's the code by which I generated a bunch of random values. <laughs> so in some ways, being very, very transparent about your synthetic data protects you as the person who made it and also protects the audiences because they have every opportunity to understand what you're doing and to make good choices about it. Um, yes, it's good, I think. <laughs> uh, someone will always get it wrong. You cannot account for how very uncooperative some people are. <laughs> But uh, protect yourself as best you can by as much transparency as you are allowed. I will. Uh, I sound like a broken record. I do apologize, but I'll go back to the cipher example because mm -hmm. they've done such a fantastic work on the on the documentation that they're providing with the study. They have worked very closely with with people at ISA as well, so the original data creators of Understanding Society. Because as Jules is saying, it is about transparency and making sure you do include what the limitations of that data are, actually. So you are, you are trying to avoid misuse as much as possible. Of course, avoiding misuse as much as possible doesn't mean no one will misuse it. We hope no one will misuse it. Um, yeah. And these are the considerations when it comes to how do I share that data for future research. Should, for example, I share that data under an end user license agreement, it doesn't necessarily have to be the UK data service one. I'm, I'm with the collections hat on, of course, I'm advertising UK ideas, but it could be any other repository. But are there specific conditions you would like to have in place to ensure that that other researchers understand what the data is, what they can use the data for. Or when it comes to, there's actually quite a lot of longitudinal studies that can only share their data via TRVs because you can't make available uh, a safeguarded, a standard safeguarded, for example, mm -hmm. um, um, study. So if it's only available via TRV, would it be useful for the cohort data management team to create synthetic data that could be shared, for example, as safeguarded data, researchers get access to the synthetic data to try and, and, and start developing their code while they get access to the TRV. It, it, it just saves time yeah. so that the applicability can be can be very different. But just exactly as Jules was saying, that transparency, making sure in that documentation, you clearly explain why the data was created, what was the purpose, what are the limitations that yeah. is that's fantastic. We are looking at providing a a, a brief, it's not a template, um, but just the but just the what you should be including in the user guide for for synthetic data. So we should be making that available um, as part of another project. Um, but we should be making that available in due course. So we hope that that will come of of, of use. Yeah, yeah. And I would <clears throat> I would encourage everyone to think: no data that we share is ever totally immune to bad actors or, um, you know, misunderstanding. And that's true of synthetic data as well. There's nothing really that stops someone from getting access to data and then changing a couple of minor details and claiming it was there, them that they collected it, and they're going to now publish it under their own name. Or, you know, people just cheat and publish things with bad, um, faked data. That's a problem. The problem really comes from people treating synthetic data as fundamentally untrustworthy when it can be very trustworthy if we document it properly, if we're clear about it. We can't stop people from being um, malicious. 
but we can do the best we can. <laughs> and part of that is by clearly documenting. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, I also think producers of synthetic data should clarify what you can and cannot do with synthetic data for users who do not understand it very well. Absolutely. I think as we get more used to the idea of synthetic data and what people are likely to use it for, we it would be very clear. It would be very nice, for example, if data producers said this data was created for code testing purposes. It is deliberately unfaithful in these ways. It is faithful in these ways. It would, it would be great to have a quick summary um, of why it was created and and in what ways it is or is not faithful. Um, that'd be great. And and as as it becomes more popular, we can hope that more data producers will sort of join up in good practice in those ways. It might take a while. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks everyone for coming. Oh, thank you so much, Jewel. Thank, thank yeah, you. Thank absolutely. you all so much for joining. Um, such such a fantastic thing. I know it's still ever so developing. And it's yeah. great to have these interactions to try to get those best best practices out there. And any questions you might have, because I know sometimes it takes a couple of days to be, oh, yes. I really wanted to ask that. Please do get in touch. Yeah. Like it it is never a bother. Um, so we'll be waiting to hear from you.